Good afternoon, everybody. I'm just letting people join the room. Welcome to, I think, the final session for you of the day, which is uh, an update on designated standards. Um, and I do just have a couple of slides at the end, also just on BSI's membership situation with Sen and Senelec and where that is at the moment. Um, though I only have a very few slides though, so I, I want to leave plenty of time for um, Q&A at the end because we have so many of you, so many questions about the issue of designated standards all the time. If you would like to um, give, do some questions, you will see um, you, you have separate boxes for Q&A and chat. Um, if you can put the, the, if you can put your question in the Q&A box, it makes it easier to handle. Um, if you do want to speak and come on microphone, we can do that for you. And if you put your hand up, then um, the conference producers can put you on mic um, and you can ask your question live. Okay, so uh, it seems that the number count has stopped going up. So um, shall we move on to the, oh, I should say, by the way, I'm Daniel Mansfield. I'm head of policy engagement in the policy team at BSI. I think some of you joined me earlier for a little um, canter through economic benefits of standards. This is something, as I say, completely different. And with that, can we go on to the next slide, please? So designated standards and in the in the UK, what does this mean? Why do we now have this system of designated standards? Um, you will all be aware of uh, what happened uh, when the UK left the EU um, and this effectively meant that regulations of EU origin were onshored to the UK on the 1st of January of this year. This means that um, the regulations remain on the statute books but there were various amendments, various statutory instruments which stripped out references to the EU and its institutions, stripped out references to things like member states, and instead put the regulations in the hands of the relevant secretaries of state for the various government departments that were responsible for those regulations. They are uh, currently effective in Great Britain, so England, Scotland and Wales, where whilst under the current arrangements, Northern Ireland continues to follow EU law and the UK government is responsible for uh, enforcing EU law in Northern Ireland. So the designated standards that we have are, uh, are used to support regulations in Great Britain, so in England, Scotland and Wales, and it's broadly equivalent as a concept to that of a harmonised standard that has been cited whose reference has been cited in the official journal of the European Union. So the change is not about the standard, but to the reference to the standard and how it's referred to. So, and alongside the changes we've had to, uh, to the way of referring to the standards, there have been other changes. For example, we've seen um, the introduction of UKCA marking, although for the moment, there is uh, on the on the UK side unilateral recognition of the CE mark, which for most products this has now been extended till the end of 2022, and for medical devices till the middle of 2023. That's a unilateral decision on the UK government side. Of course, where that where that is relevant to standards, the underpinning standards are technically the same, even with the two different uh, sort of marking and conformity assessment regimes. I'm not here really to talk about UKCA, CE marking or conformity assessment specifically, um, aside from where the, uh, they, it does actually relate to standards. But if you do have questions and you're not quite sure how to get it answered at the end, feel free to answer it. And if I can't, I might be able to put you in touch with who can. Anyway, if we can have the next slide, please. So with designating standards, that is a government responsibility. It is government which designates the standards and users of standards should consult the listing on the Gov UK website. Um, 
as you might be used to seeing uh, the way they're listed on in the, in the official journal on the on the Europa website standards in the UK are also listed by sector and regulation so that you can see the standards that apply for any particular regulation. Standards being considered for designation are also listed and I have just put a screenshot there on the right hand side of a bit of the Gov UK designated standards page. And if you just look in the bottom corner where it says detailed guidance and then designated standards, new or amended notices of publication. So this is where, where, new, where standards are proposed for designation. They are listed first there before they are formally added to the list of designated standards. And this allows government to ask the question of users about whether the standard is sufficient for providing presumption of conformity to the essential requirements or the essential characteristics of the relevant regulation. The, uh, it's, um, it's, it's not really a consultation, it's just a, a, a sense check from the government. And really the only question they are asking is, is whether the standard is sufficient for providing presumption of conformity. It's not an opportunity to open up debate about the content of the standards themselves. That's something that should come back to BSI and is not part of this process. I've put the uh, web link up there, so it's quite simple. But actually, if you, in your search box, in whatever your preferred search engine is, if you search UK designated standards or Gov UK designated standards or any sensible search term, it will take you straight to this page. Um, and it is this page which uh, you always need to consult to find out what is the latest listing um, of standards for, for any regulation or any sector that you're interested in. Um, if we go to the next page, please. Next slide. So uh, what have we been doing? When I say designated standard, that's a government responsibility. So what have we been doing at BSI to support that? And really, I've got um, three stages of, of interaction to talk about here. So the earliest stage, um, which sort of took us really from last year through to the earlier part of this year, um, there were various things we did. So we have, um, that enable us to publish standards, we have data that comes to us from the European Standards Organization, CEN and CENELEC. Um, and um, various bits of that data are useful to government, particularly where we're talking about harmonized standards. So these are standards that are being developed in response to EU law. Various key stages are uh, important to government when they're considering what might those standards, what might the relevance of those standards be to UK law. So um, that's part of sort of a data feed that we now give to government, which is used for internal purposes. It's not a publicly viewable database. But we also work very early on on updating the boilerplate text that we use in national forwards in, 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 in BS implementations of standards. We established contact points in all of the relevant departments that had regulations that use designated standards. And really from the get go, we started receiving um, a significant number of queries um, from government and from stakeholders, very, obviously at various different levels. Um, but at the same time, we were operating in a position when all of those regulations were onshored at the beginning of the year the uh, EU and UK regulations were still technically equivalent. Even if, even if we now had two different legal orders, the technical provisions of all of the regulations were identical and, so, and, and all of the underpinning standards as well. So on and, and this first point of the year, the list of designated standards that was published on Gov UK was effectively the same list as, uh, as um, in the official journal at that same time. And during this early stage in 2021, we uh, started to introduce a designated flag um, in BSI online products, for example, in British Standards Online um, and in Compliance Navigator that, that, that for medical devices, so that when looking at the bibliographic details of a standard, users can see, is it designated? 
something that sort of came about uh, from the middle of this year onwards um, was we, we started improving the data feed that we give to Bayes with a, some more detailed contextual information to the government. So um, details around if the UK had submitted a negative vote, for example, to a standard that's useful to government. Also starting to, as well as Sen and Senelec data, putting some um, details in of the um, admittedly very small number of um, harmonized Etsy standards, but still it, it's still significant. So that's gone into that set of data as well. And we started to work out, work out what further information uh, our stakeholders might need. Um, and then we had the first piece of technical divergence in terms of the regulation itself. So the new um, EU medical devices regulation came into force in May, of course, also applicable in Northern Ireland. So this meant that um, you had a change in the regulation on the EU side, but not in the UK. So this is some technical divergence. Um, and so thinking about that and thinking more broadly we've started we started to think about whether we would need uk national annexes to go alongside the european annexes zazz in cases where you had a harmonized standard that um in in its annex zazz provided references to the eu regulation whether we would need to provide pointers to um clauses in uk regulation where there was a difference um, and in the medical devices area, we did produce a few of those annexes, really just to, uh, to, to, to show that the same standard could, uh, in fact, point to, to two different pieces of regulation. None of the, um, the standards that we provided UK annexes for, so these were revisions of uh, European standards, none of them have been designated yet. So for us, it was more of a test case on producing the annex rather than a test case from the government side on doing the designation. Uh, we provided, we developed a further update to the national forward text, and we started to also add to our online uh, products um, where standards are cited in the official journal. So for, for, for those standards designated would be a flag for uh, the reference to UK um, regulation and OJEU cited would be uh, also there where the standard is cited for um, relevance to EU regulation and also applicable in Northern Ireland. Moving forward, we can expect to see just as an inevitable consequence of the changes in regulate, you know, regulations are updated. So we will begin to see more technical divergence uh, in, in existing regulation. Um, but also we are working with um, the standards policy team in the Office for Product Safety and Standards at Bayes to um, look at what a standards request process and format should be for, for the UK. So as well as divergences in the regulation that we have in the UK of EU origin, if, if we have new native, for want of a better word, regulation coming in in the UK, um, and there is a need to support that through um, designated standards to provide that presumption of conformity, what that format, what, what that request would look like. So we, we also expect to see so continued use of uh, ENs, European standards. We remember they're not EU standards, they're much wider and perhaps other standards to uh, support UK only needs and regulations. And, but of course, BSI and its committees, we continue to develop standards. We continue to participate in all of the standards bodies according to their rules, so SEN and SENELAC, but also ISO and IEC. And the government will continue to designate uh, in the UK um, to meet its needs and to meet the needs of UK stakeholders. So, you know, um, the, I think the point for us as BSI is to um, really just stay on top of what's going on and um, maintain that dialogue with government the whole time about what their needs might be. And if we go on to the next slide, uh, just before actually, I've got, I've got a little process, but just here, just this is an extract. Uh, so for example, I looked at British Standards Online yesterday, 
um, looked at EN 71, the toy standard, many of you will know that, a part 14, trampolines, and you can see that we have the flag there designated. Um, the flag is still to come, I think in BSOL that has OJEU cited, but this is all part of the continuing development of, of what we do to, uh, to help customers when they come to our online offerings. Um, and if we go to the next slide, please. Thinking about designation, I think uh, we get a lot of queries from stakeholders saying, well, what is the process? Um, what are the new legal requirements? Um, how can a committee influence the government designation decision? How can the committee participate in a government designation decision? So I thought this graphic might help. It's sort of a, it's a bit of a, a BSI sandwich in between the two bits of government, in, in between sort of two aspects of government. So where on the left-hand side, you've got government developing its policy and regulations and on the right hand side you've got government working out and how does it use the standard and in the middle you've got BSI developing standards so if I just talk you through what I'm trying to uh, represent on this slide so on the left hand side government is responsible for developing policy and regulations that's its job of course that's what it does and it may like to consider delivery of that policy or of those or supporting that uh, policy and regulations through standards. And it might want to do that because, you know, it needs to benefit from the stakeholder led approach of standards. The fact that standards can, are proportionate to what um, industry and stakeholders can agree. Internally within government, there are all kinds of drivers all the time to demonstrate various sort of better regulation type approaches. Is government being as smart as it could be? Um, thinking about proportionate and practical regulation. Also thinking about how to enable compliance. This is really important in areas where compliance um, is, uh, is, is critical. Um, it's not simply enough, I think, to uh, sometimes to have a regulation where it, with the, that's about finding fault and prosecuting. It's actually about how do you enable um, good faith actors to comply? Um, and standards can answer that question. And so when they're considering the delivery through standards, they will be thinking about their options for standards development. We may well be talking to them about, about that. Um, but really, it, it's, it's something that needs to come from the government side, including perhaps guidance to uh, BSI and to uh, the relevant committee on what the policy needs are, what, their, what the essential requirements might be, and all of the rest of it. And, um, and so that may lead to some sort of request that goes to BSI to develop standards, or if this is in the case of where we're looking at policy and regulation, of, of EU origin, where we're looking at an evolution of what we already have. There may well be standards already on the books coming through from Sen and Senelec. It may not be um, um, a, a formal request, but it may well be advice to BSI on, on, on what the government's needs are. And so when it comes to us at BSI, then of course, what we do is we support and maintain the committees and their standards work. If we are receiving a request from government to develop standards in response to some essential requirements, then we still operate according to our rules. You know, so we still, with our committees, operate that full consensus process, making sure we have the optimum stakeholder balance around the table. And so, and it may be in looking at that request, we need to clarify some of the policy steer that we've received. But what we can also do because of the view that our committees have, if there are existing standards, if there is existing standards work going on, whether it's within BSI, in CENSEN, like ISO IEC, we can point to it and we, we can sort of build that into part of how we think about answering this question from government about what the policy needs might be. 
given that BSI in its position as the national standards body for the whole of the UK is also the standards body for Northern Ireland, then there is the important question of relevance to Northern Ireland markets as well that we need to consider at this point um, in terms of uh, being able to provide a standard that serves all of the territory. And then we may well be developing and delivering new standards, or we may well have uh, standards coming through, for example, from Sen and Senelec, and there might be some additional UK needs or some additional UK requirements, and we'll need to think about how we handle those. So we pretty much, we still, even with that request coming from government, we, um, we so um, when I mean we, I mean sort of BSI and its committees and everybody corporately, we still do our job of developing standards in accordance with all of those rules. Back to government, and, and this isn't necessarily uh, purely linear, um, but government will at some point be assessing the resulting standard or drafts at least um, for their fitness to provide a presumption of conformity to, to the regulation. So to the essential, essential requirements, the safety requirements, the essential characteristics, whatever, however the regulation is defined. And at this point, I do need to stress that we're talking about designated standards here. So we are talking very much about those standards that give presumption of conformity to regulation. We're not talking about the broader environment of standards that might help meet policy in other ways. That may well be taken care of in, in, in the initial conversation in the first two columns. It may actually be that a designated standard is not the route here because we're not talking about that sort of presumption of conformity. But in the context of designated standards, then government's role is to look at the standard um, and um, work out, does it actually give presumption of conformity? And so if there are no concerns about that, we'd expect them to make that decision on designation, um, list it as proposed for designation on GovUK and that the standard would eventually appear. If there are some issues, then there might be some dialogue with the committee to iron that out. If it's if it's of UK origin, that might be quite simple. If it's a European standard, maybe less so, or an international one, it might take a bit longer. So there might be a designation decision that actually designates the standard, maybe, but maybe with one or two restrictions, and that would be listed on GovUK. But again, that's a government decision, or they may decline to designate it, or there may be no designation, in which case, in the absence of a standard, as we have now, then um, if, if the regulation is in force, then the, um, you, you don't have the standard to give you presumption of conformity, you have to find another way. With, with all of this, you'll notice I've put those looping arrows at the bottom, I think there's always going to be, um, during this process, feedback loops all along the way. That, and, and, and part of the job that we're trying to do now is make sure that that feedback can happen um, and that we know, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and that we know what's going on and we operate really in a culture of no surprises with government. I know some of you, if you've been on European committees and you've had long protracted discussions with uh, in committees and engagement with has consultants um, around citation of harmonized standards may, may, may carry the bruises of some of these earlier um, battles and uh, what we're trying to do is learn from that here but also remember whose responsibility is what and actually when it comes to designation that, that is something that the government makes its own mind up if there are queries we can handle them but we do not there is not at the minute envisaged a role for our committees in actually making that designation decision what, what our committees what our experts do is develop the standard and if there are some essential requirements we're trying to meet then you know this is our best way of trying to do it and then it's sort of over to government to make that decision we can obviously hear the queries if there are some that come back but but but, but that's it so I hope that helps set out uh, who's responsible for what um, and if we just go on to the next slide please Um, just before I take Q&A on designated standards, um, and I can see um, a couple have popped up, just worth um, spending a couple of moments on our membership of Sen and Senelec. I haven't been in every other session today, so I'm not sure how much of this has already been covered today. Some of it may come up tomorrow or so in the live 
in the live um, event if some of you are participating that in that. So um, those of you that have seen the communications we've put out since the um, referendum will have seen all of the work we've done uh, to um, speak to our committee members, to our stakeholders, to understand what our position should be with regard to Senate Senelec. And we had overwhelming support for continuing to participate in Senate Senelec because uh, UK businesses, UK stakeholders still need these standards. And of course, they're not EU standards, they're much wider. So where are we at the minute? So uh, you would have seen um, earlier in the year, that um, SEN and SENELEC members had agreed a new model of membership for BSI from the 1st of January of next year, known as yellow membership. So this, it's, it separates out the members of SEN and SENELEC as being as, as, as national standards bodies or standards bodies from countries which are, um, you, you know, you know what, what the degree of separation is from the EU. So, and we are in, we're, we're in a category of one, um, as non-EU uh, members, but um, there are criteria there to do with um, sort of technical compa compatibility of regulations and things like that. So that was that was agreed um, from the first of January, and we have until we have until the end of this year we're in a transition period relate for the statutes. And that final transition to the new yellow uh, membership category will be confirmed at the General Assemblies in San and Senelec, we hope, next week um, in Palermo, so where um, some of my colleagues are going and uh, we look forward to that decision next week. And this is following an assessment we had in August. This was effectively a peer review we had um, from uh, colleagues from um, Austria and Italy um, who did an audit of all of our processes and um, we don't anticipate, you know, you know, as far as we are concerned, that went well. Um, and so it's all looking hopeful that everything will be confirmed next week. <coughs> so that's that's about uh, BSI status as a member of Senate and Senate, um, and the fact that BSI is the NSB from uh, the national standards body of a non-EU country. On the right hand side, you will notice, well, this is the same as it ever was. We still have the ob obligation to adopt European standards as national standards and withdraw conflicting standards. So all of those obligations continue as before, stand still all the rest of it. Technical participation, that continues as before as well. So UK uh, experts can participate in any committee. We can provide chairs and conveners as now, and we can provide secretariat. And as has been the case since I think the middle of 2020, we have a full weighted vote in the non-EEA category. And if we just have the next slide. So the headline really in terms of seven select members is that the obligation of rights of participation for BSI and UK experts uh, are unchanged by the new membership category. That is the big headline there. Um, and um, I think the next slide has just got my contact details. So that is the end of the slides I wanted to take you through today. I can see there are some questions that popped up in the Q&A. Right. And um, some of them, some of them, right, I think we can, we can answer quite. So Alexander, Alexander Rankin, couple of questions from you. How designated standards fit with, oh, I was just having a wobble there with my connection. How designated standards fit with SEN, SENELEC, ETSI, ESO copyright requirements? Um, designated standards, um, the, well, the references are on Gov UK, so that's the designated bit. The standards themselves are European standards. Um, at the moment, they might, uh, we might also see some British standards designated in the future. Um, but for all of those standards, BSI is the copyright holder. So we, um, for Sen and Senelec, um, and for ISO and IEC, we are, um, they operate on a shared copyright model. And so we're responsible for copyright in the UK. Um, and so the status of designated standard doesn't affect copyright arrangements. These are two separate things. 
In terms of a pressure between standards development between NI and GB, I think this is the point of standards. Um, we already see that, you know, um, it's only, remember that it's only a relatively small number of standards, so about 20% of European standards or less, which uh, have this presumption of conformity to regulation. Over 80% don't really relate to regulation specifically. And then if you add in um, ISO and IEC standards, obviously there's a heavy overlap there between ISO and SEN and IEC and CENELEC. Um, it shows you that standards can be used in many different legal orders already. For designated standards, it's a bit more specific. So we are thinking about where the same standard could provide presumption of conformity to two different legal orders. And I think the point there is that actually it's perhaps more essential than ever that UK experts are bringing their views to Senate Senate committees where there are issues which could cause difficulty in the UK. Um, we would like those issues to, to be raised if there are you know, technical concerns. And I think it's in the interest of all of the members that all of the members of Senate and Senate that the concerns of all members are represented in developing standards. So, I think the point of working together on standards is to avoid that sort of pressure and to seek to um, find technical solutions. Um, in terms of uh, right, Abdul's question, further larger divergence resulting from the current consultation on the future regulation of medical devices in the United Kingdom. Do we have the capacity and resources to keep up with everything to being developed in the international arena? I think Abdul, um, some of that question <laughs> goes far beyond my remit. Um, the, uh, yes, Emmet, there is an active consultation open from MHRA at the moment on future medical device regulation in the UK. It has, um, I think it has a, a, a several hundred questions. So um, if you want to do a deep dive and answer that, I'd encourage any stakeholder here to get involved if it's relevant to them. It's worth thinking about with medical devices that actually the marketplace here is global and so um, manufacturers and in fact the conformity assessment bodies that help them are used to operating with multiple legal orders on multiple different markets um, and so um, on, on one hand standards again are a way of bridging all of those gaps um, in terms of whether the UK has capacity and resources to keep up with everything developed I uh, that that's far from me to comment um, you know you know that um, another part of BSI is very active as a notified and approved body in this area in the UK and in and in the EU and and there are other bodies out there that are doing that um, I mean this is one of the things that regulators such as MHRA will be grappling with in terms of what the capacity is for the UK and how they serve UK stakeholders uh, who are trying to operate on a global market Right, if we move to Andrea's question. As you know, the Commission is thinking about taking over responsibility for construction product standards. And here we have a new construction product regulation in the pipeline for 2022. How will this potential of divergence be handled? Will we be able to develop our own construction product standards if the EU ones become more regulation than standard? Right, there is a lot there. And of course, at the moment, um, uh, all of this is, um, I, th I think there are, uh, at various stages of suggestion and proposal on the EU side and the UK side. I won't comment on um, the EU side and where, where that may or may not be at the moment. In terms of uh, what's happening in the UK, of course, yes, well, we've got the new construction product regulator function being created as well. And for as long as the standards are SEN standards, um, or SEN I'm not sure if there's any sound like ones, but for as long as they are European standards in the existing system, we will continue to operate um, according um, to our role and responsibility as a member of SEN. Um, if we need to develop UK own UK only requirements, um, part of the context for that would be as a member of SEN and SENLEC, what can we what, what what can we and should we do there? So um, there might be some uh, things that need to be considered very carefully with, depending on how this develops, but I think at the moment nothing is certain enough. Um, aside from the fact to, to say that we are of course in um, dialogue with uh, the Department for 
um, leveling up housing and communities who's responsible for construction standards and we are in dialogue of course all the time with OPSS um, and the work it's doing to set up the new construction products regulator so um, uh, we will do what we can in line with our rules and in line with the responsibilities that we have um, but if things become regulatory um, then that takes some things out of our hands either on the, whether it takes it out of the standards body side on the European side or whether it, they become part of regulation on the UK side. I mean, that's that's a regulator's prerogative to do that, isn't it? And we would respond in kind depending on what happened. Sorry, that's a bit of a, well, it depends sort of answer, but I think that's all I can, that's as much as I could say there. I, um, I don't know if there's, uh, Right, let's just get to, let's have a look at uh, these other written questions. If there's an existing standard we believe deserves some greater attention at government level, for example, collaborative business relationships, is there a way of flagging this? Well, Adrian, that's a really good question. And maybe something like collaborative business relationships isn't um, in the space of designated standards, if we remember that designated standards are about providing presumption of conformity to essential requirements of regulations. However, I and other colleagues in the policy team, as well as our colleagues in the standards development team, are always looking to um, increase government's knowledge of useful standards that, uh, that we think government could get behind in order to achieve more and achieve more of its policy aims. So I think um, uh, if you could work with uh, the, your committee manager on that, but also feel free to, um, um, to drop me a note in the, stand, in the policy team um, and uh, we can work with colleagues to see what we could do to raise awareness. Stuart Newstead, some standards related to environment, environmental legislation are designated as environmental regulation in the UK diverges from the EU. Does the obligation to adopt DN standards prevent the development of BS standards to support the new regulation? I think that's a really, uh, that's a really interesting question, Stuart. So um, we do have obligations, as I said, as a, as, as a member of Sam and Senelec. Ideally, what we should always do is, through the UK delegation, reflect UK needs into the development of European standards. And that should always be our, uh, our first port of call. If we uh, were to have a, 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 more, a sort of a more serious issue, then we'd need to look at it at the time. But I think that's, uh, I think that's all I could say there. Um, has anyone raised their hand or if you please do raise your hand if there's something that you would like to say live. Um, I think we might be nearing the end of the allotted time but happy to um, take any more questions or do stick your hand up if you want to come on the microphone. Uh, right, I haven't seen anything else come up so um if that's the case then well thank you all for listening um to this i hope this answered some questions there are some contact details there so there's my direct contact detail on the screen we also have um the designated admin email address which we're using to funnel all questions about designated standards because as you can imagine, we get lots of queries that are similar. And so we are um, constantly developing our Q&A set to make sure that we can answer them accurately. So feel free to get in touch. And uh, if that's the case, uh, then, well, thank you all. And um, thank you for listening and um, have a good evening. <laughs>